All right, Energy 808, the cutting edge here on the given Monday morning. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and the fellow on the other end of the phone is Marco Mangelsdorf. Hi, Marco. You're here and they're there, and we are all together once again, Jay. Great to be back with you from the island of Molokai. Yeah, I heard one of the principal restaurants in Molokai closed. How does that affect you? Well, I just got here yesterday, so I haven't swung by or stopped at uh, what's called Paddler's Inn, which is one of the few, relatively few restos in the whole darn island. Uh, so I don't know whether they're still under the uh, Department of Health red card of, uh, of shame in terms of uh, cockroaches here and there. So I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. All right. I'll expect you to. Let's talk about some energy things. What do you think? This is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. And let's cut some edge. Uh, how about discussing first the Hawaii Supreme Court's decision on Huhonua? This is a sort of groundbreaking decision, don't you think? It is. It is. It goes back to, if I'm not mistaken, the 10th of uh, February, or excuse me, 10th of May, and uh, our Hawaii Supreme Court ruled uh, in a five to nothing vote in favor of Henry Curtis and Life of the Land in his lawsuit against the state of Hawaii, specifically challenging the PUC's decision back in mid-2017 to approve a power purchase agreement between Hawaii Electric Light Company, Helco, and the Huhonua power plant up in Pepekeo, a little bit up, uh, up along the Hamakua coast from Hilo. And uh, I, I was really uh, hardened and, and very pleased and, and, and gratified that uh, this could be a first in terms of perhaps a Hawaii or any type of state Supreme Court that took the commission to task and and is remanding that decision to approve the PPA, remanding it back to the commission because, quote, it had failed to explicitly consider the state's goal of reducing greenhouse gases, which is required under state law. So, uh, you know, I've been here working pretty much full-time for the past 20 years and involved in Hawaii for over 40 in the energy scene. And I cannot recall an instance where a Hawaii Supreme Court effectively overturned a commission, a regulatory decision, and sent it back to the commission for reconsideration. I mean, that's unprecedented. So uh, I was hoping that's what the, the court would do and that they, in fact, have done it. And uh, it'll probably be not until late this year, I'm going to guess, maybe early into next year, where the commission will have reopened this particular uh, issue and brought in new testimony and then somehow uh, operationalizes in, in some type of, I don't know, at least qualitative, if not quantitative form, operationalizing what does it mean uh, that... The, the commission needs to take into account the effect of emissions of burning trees in that power plant, 20 plus megawatts worth. What's the effect on the quality of the environment, both on the Big Island, the state of Hawaii, and the planet writ large? I mean, how do you operationalize that? So I think Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, and, and Leo uh, Suncion, they have their hands full in going where few, if any, commissions have gone before. Well, some thoughts about that. I mean, don't you think they did consider, um, you know, the green aspect and the goals, but they found that this uh, somehow fit within all of that? Don't you think they considered that? They're just as... Uh, well, I'd have to go back and, and read the DNO from two years ago, and Randy, our friend Randy Wasser was the chair of the commission, but uh, it would appear that if there was any discussion or consideration on the part of the commission two years ago that it was insufficient, obviously insufficient as far as our court is concerned in terms of putting that in the mix as far as deciding to approve that PPA or not. Hmm. Well, now you said that uh, the court re uh, remanded it to the commission because it did not explicitly indicate uh, the, you know, the effect, the environmental effect of this, uh, this burning. Um, but isn't it entirely possible that they had their reasons and they just wrote a decision that didn't, for some reason, include a paragraph on that subject? Um, I mean, I, was there anything in the Supreme Court opinion that indicated that uh, they wanted it remanded for further evidence? Or could the uh, commission, you know, simply say, yeah, we considered that. That is absolutely part of our reasoning. And here's, here is our reasoning. Add a paragraph back in. End of story. Problem solved. 
Isn't that a, a logical possibility? Uh, is it a possibility? Theoretically, yes. Is it a logical possibility, a practical possibility? I, I, I don't think so. You think that, that this, this opinion by the Supreme Court requires them to take evidence? Yes, I do. I do. And you've got, of course, a new makeup on the court. Uh, I mean, uh, Jay Griffin was just starting his term uh, mid-2017 under Randy. Uh, Randy, of course, is uh, retired. Uh, Lauren Akiba is gone. And now we have uh, Jay, of course, as chair, Jenny Potter, and Leo Asuncion as the additional commission members. So I, I believe it's a new dynamic, and uh, different commissioners, of course, different, bring different perspectives. So, uh, I mean, you know, to, to tip my cards, I, I do hope that uh, Hu Honua, uh, when all is said and done, will be found to be not in the public interest, because my, my position is that we can do better, we must do better in terms of burning stuff, whatever the stuff happens to be, when it comes to bringing new power generation online, not just in the state or on the Big Island, but in the, in the world writ large. We just have to do better. We have to uh, take a different path if we have the choice of burning something to produce power or not burning something to produce power. Uh, in virtually all cases, I would, I would argue strongly that it has to be in the direction of not burning things to, use to, to produce power. Well, let's assume they went out and looked for evidence. Um, that it wasn't a public interest on, on an environmental basis and that the burning was somehow consistent with the, the goal of achieving 100% uh, you know, renewables. Um, is there evidence they could find, or is, or is that a dry hole anyway? I'm sorry, evidence to what effect, please? Evidence that it was consistent with the target of clean energy, you know, of 100% renew renewables, you know, our state target, our state, um, our state goal and mission. Is it possible uh, that there w is evidence out there? I mean, assuming for a moment that they need to go and look at that evidence, um, this is really an interesting position for new commissioners. Uh, is it possible that there's evidence out there that would support that? I, I can't explicitly speak to that, but I think you're missing an important point here, if I may be so bold, which is that the, the, the court's decision makes explicit the value the court puts on environmental quality. And that, of course, goes beyond just meeting, meeting certain RPS or renewable portfolio standards or percentages, goals that are, you know, targets for 2030 or 2035, 2045, and so forth. So in my view, the, the court's decision looks at it not just simply in terms of uh, greenhouse gases uh, and meeting percentages of renewables by such and such a time, but looks at the broader environmental impacts, which is exactly one of the things that Henry Curtis in Life of the Land was arguing in terms of pursuing that case. Well, let me, let me say that, uh, you know, you can go out. I mean, there are different views on this, I think. You could go out and, and uh, find somebody, maybe uh, Honua to say that, no, no, we intended to uh, put a cap on the smoke, that there's new technology out there that would, very, would seriously limit the smoke that would come out of this. So the, so the burning is going to be, um, you know, like condensed. Uh, I remember uh, I visited a, a, a gas burning facility, which exists today in Kauai, and they, they have technology there that limits the amount of carbon that comes out of the burning. Uh, well, they could do that kind of thing. Maybe it's even further advanced now, um, you know, in Huhonua, and limit the smoke. You wouldn't even see the smoke. It would all be, you know, condensed into carbon blocks, which could be sold and used for other, you know, productive things. So it's not, it's not a fait accompli, is it, uh, that the, the project these guys have in mind is, is, uh, is by necessity going to have uh, carbon and smoke going out into the atmosphere? and thus affecting our environment, right? Well, I mean, burning anything, you can do carbon sequestration, you can put scrubbers on, you can scrub it to 90x percent in terms of stuff not going to the atmosphere. But as far as I know, there's no way to get to 100%. I mean, burning any type of, of uh, organic material is going to release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And there's no way of getting around that. So I, I just remain firmly committed that we must and we, we can, we must do better than burning anything when it comes 
comes to producing uh, new power generation. And, and let me also bring up an, uh, another point, which I think is also very important. This PPA was going to be in force for 30 years, 3-0, 30 years, at a remuneration rate of somewhere over 20 cents a kilowatt hour for burning not just trees that would be grown along the Hamakua coast, but there was also specific provisions in that PPA that allowed the owner of Huhonua to bring trees or other organic biomass from wherever they so chose in order to feed biomass into that power plant. 20 cents. So 20 cents is 20 too, cents, it's 20, too high. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it was an atrocious deal from the get-go. And the, the Huonua folks said, well, we're going to be planting saplings, and that's going to offset or more than offset the trees we're cutting down. And, you know, let, let's call that what it is. And since we're a family-oriented show here, we won't get into profanity, but that's, uh, that's a bit hard to swallow, that the notion that saplings in the near term are going to take the place in terms of carbon consumption that grown trees, trees that are decades old, I mean, that just, to me, is absurd on its face. Well, let me, let me give you another logical possibility. I'm loaded with logical possibilities. And, and that is the, uh, you know, the PUC has newly constituted effectively since then, um, reads this opinion, and they say, hmm, you know, this, this, wasn't, this didn't work out. Uh, we're going to take a fresh look at this um, you know, uh, right on its face. And we're going to say, hey, um, times have changed. We are more concerned about the environment, perhaps, than we were at the time the PUC wrote this. Uh, thanks to the Supreme Court for reminding us. Um, and uh, yes, that is the law. And there's nothing in the record. And we're not going to waste any more time on this. And furthermore, you know, to us, this is too high a price. So we're going we're gonna, to, you know, what? Disapprove it right now. End of story. You know, one, one page per curium decision, end of case, uh, no approval. Isn't that a logical possibility? I can't speak to that, uh, and I can't channel exactly what the commission is going to do in, in the months to come, Jay, but I would think that it's going to be more than just a one or two page uh, uh, quick and, you know, kind of down and dirty decision. I think it's going to be substantially more more pros and more uh, examining the evidence uh, and, and coming up with justification for, for whatever decision that they're going to make. Yeah, here we go. In the meantime, uh, I, I take it that Hohunu is not doing anything. No, I mean, they would be rather foolish to, I mean, they've been trying to convince Helco these past months to please let us start selling you power, to which Helco said, uh, no, we're not going to do that. So, you know, by their own account, they've got somewhere around $200 million plus million sunk into that facility. Already. And, yeah, already. Ooh. So it's kind of hurry up and wait. You know, and my friend uh, Warren Lee, who came out of retirement uh, to head that project up, I, I got to imagine that Warren, you know, didn't really think that he was getting, getting into this amount of brouhaha from his retirement perch. So... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's still more to be written on, on Huonua, and uh, uh, my gut tells me that uh, there ain't no biomass plant that's going to come online on our island uh, and the, in the decades to come. Yeah. So, you know, one, one other question, just to clarify. So you have the PUC made this ruling a couple of years ago. Um, now the Supreme Court, you know, uh, reverses or remands uh, back to PUC. Who brought it up to the Supreme Court? Who appealed the ruling? It wasn't who knew it. Was it Henry Curtis? Absolutely. You know, and I give full kudos and respect and great admiration to our friend Henry Curtis at Life of the Land for, for decades now being kind of a, uh, a conscience and a clarion call to say, hey, this, this isn't right. I mean, I'm sure, you know, by Henry's admission, he's, he's, he's lost his fair share of battles as well. But this is one that he, he prevailed spectacularly. So I have a great amount of appreciation yeah. for Henry for, for doing this. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting. That's a clear win for him and, and for others who take similar positions going forward. Uh, we're going to take a short break, Marco. When we come back, I want to talk about PGV, uh, uh, Pune Geothermal Venture, and see where that is, uh, given uh, you know, the work that's being done to try to restore uh, Pune. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. 
And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. <laughs> Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at three, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Energy 808. We're here. We're live with... Um Marco Mangelsdorf, he joins us from Molokai. And uh, now we're going to talk about uh, PGV, another big issue um, on the Big Island uh, having to do with ge geothermal. So what's the status, Marco? Well, let me do a little kind of preamble uh, to kind of set the stage. So, you know, Puna Geothermal Venture has been a power plant operating in lower Puna, East Puna, for uh, going back to 1992, 1993. So they had had a pretty darn successful run in terms of producing a substantial amount of renewable energy for a quarter of a century. Uh, in April of last year, if someone had asked me, are you in favor of shutting PGV down? I would have said no, no. That, uh, that doesn't make sense. It's an operating power plant. I may have some issues with it on a number of levels in terms of pricing, uh, some risks involved, but I was not one of these people who was anti-geothermal from the get-go. Then, of course, uh, May typically comes after April in the, in the calendar sequence, and the beginning of May of last year, things started rumbling to a substantial degree in the Lower East Rift Zone. Uh, 24 fissures, I think, we ended up with, with the, the, the greatest, uh, most widespread eruption in that area in over 100 years. And now, to fast forward to June 3rd, 2019, uh, PGV and ORMAT, its parent company based in Reno, Nevada, has been putting time, effort, and money into bringing that power plant back online. This is even after the plant was uh, physically isolated from road access due to the lava flow. This is after a number of wells were overrun by lava. This was after uh, several thousand gallons of combustible, flammable pentane were, were spirited out in great haste. Uh, towards the beginning of the eruption because there was a fear of the plant being completely inundated and that pentane going up in a fireball. So we have the folks to PGV and ORMAT who are seeking to bring the power plant back online. And this has generated a substantial amount of discussion, uh, as it should, as to whether this is in the public interest to do so, with people saying both yes it is, including our friend Mike Calacchini, who's the general manager there, other people who are pro-geothermal, and then on the, the opposite side of the fence are people like Senator Russell Ruderman, the Puna Pono Alliance, Puna, Puna Pono Alliance, and others who believe that uh, it's folly to bring a power plant back online in, in that area, in a geothermal plant at least. So. The news of the past few weeks is that uh, last month, early last month, uh, the, our Public Utilities Commission notified HELCO and PGV that due to the necessity of reconstructing and putting up new replaced uh, transmission power poles, that this was going to be putting the power poles back in place, which are required to bring the power plant back online and feeding power to the grid, that that's going to require PUC scrutiny. So this has opened the door effectively to uh, state agencies, including the Department of Health, including Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, the PUC. This is giving more and more entities and more and more people 
uh, a seat at the table in this discussion as to whether PGV should come back online. Is it in the public interest to, for it to come back online? And my position is that it should not, that it is too much risk, it is too dangerous at this point to be moving forward with, a, uh, with, with revivifying that plant in light of what's happened in the past year or so. We can and must do better than, than more risky power sources like this. And just, uh, I'll say one more thing before I stop talking for now, which is uh, the, one of the more recent letters from HELCO to the commission last month on the subject on PGV noted that, that there was a so-called uh, emergency event, emergency event that took place recently at the power plant, which had to do with, I believe it was four wooden power pole poles on PGV property, which had essentially become toasted as in compromise because of so-called underground residual heat. So needless to say, there is uh, still quite a bit of, um, shall we say, activity in that part of the island, and to me, uh, it just does not make sense in terms of the risks involved for that power plant to come back online. Hmm. I, I have three reactions to that. Um, you know, one is, um, you know, there's, there's a purchase power agreement out there, and uh, I guess that's really not standing in the way. EGV is entitled to resume under the purchase power agreement. Um, two is, uh, you said that, uh, you know, they have successfully delivered power to the Big Island for 25 years, but there's always been resistance uh, all the way through, um, and including now. And sometimes, sometimes, at some points in the 90s, that resistance was humongous. I mean, there were death threats um, about Pele, Pele's breast, all that, way back when. And, and it, it never really stopped. So there's always been a, a, a fuming fight about this. All, all the way through. And the third is, um, well, gee whiz, you know, yeah, it's still, there's still some volcanic action going on, but that doesn't mean that what happened a year ago is going to happen all the time. Uh, they managed to get through 25 years without a problem. I mean, volcanically. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, a, a couple of poles uh, with residual heat are an indicator that this is, uh, an, you know, an ongoing volcanic problem. The likelihood is, the probability is it's, it's going to be okay, at least for a long time. Um, question, there are two questions that, that come out of that, though. One is, 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 the, is the cultural fight over? No, it's not over. And maybe this, this all reflects, with, with, like with Senator Rudiman, or was, is he still the senator? Uh, Russell Rudiman. Yes, he is. Um, yes. With uh, Senator Rudiman, you know, he's, he's reflecting community community concerns, and they are largely cultural. And that's a reality. That's not the law, simply not, but that's a reality. And the other reality is that the, uh, the, the, cost, of, um, the cost of delivering uh, electrical power from PGV is also probably too high, like who, who know it? Uh, who, who know it? You, you, you know, you've got to get back to a, a more current um, marketplace-type value, and, and we don't have that under the... Um, you know, under the reality of the, uh, of the purchase power agreement. And th these are practical points, not necessarily legally one, legal ones or scientific ones. Um, and that's what's standing in the way of this. I mean, you, I think you had the cultural thing standing in the way. And although it's unspoken, um, you have the high price standing in the way. And that's what we're really dealing with. So, yeah, there's, there's so much resistance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to say that PGV may be history but not for the reasons that are specifically, you know, legally indicated. What do you think? Well, let me respond a couple ways. One is, if you had asked all the bright minds at the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to disparage them in any way, shape, or form, if you'd asked those people la April 1st of last year, okay, April Fool's Day, please tell us what the likelihood is within 30 or so days' time there's going to be the largest eruption in the lower East Rift Zone that we've seen for more than 100 years. How do you think they would have responded? I don't think you would have found one of them that would have said, yes, I think that probability is extremely high. 
My point being is that Mother Nature, Madame Pele, is by its, their very nature, or her very nature, destined to be surprising and to be unpredictable. Oh, absolutely, Marco. So, but let me add that we are in a time of climate change, the kind of climate change that could bite us all in no time, any time. Um, in fact, it is predictable. Uh, this is an El Nino year. Uh, these islands have managed to escape uh, severe weather. I mean, really severe weather for a long time, but it's, it's on the way. It's coming. And um, we could, you know, and, and that's different, of course, from volcanic action. That's uh, the kind of weather that would, that would tear apart uh, any uh, uh, solar structure and who knows what else in the, in the grid. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm hearkening back to the thought about diversity and having a portfolio that includes many diverse sources. So uh, wouldn't diversity be good? Because, because we have unpredictable things happening uh, as a result of climate change that, that we, can't, we can predict them, actually. Uh, we know they're going to happen. We just don't know exactly when. No, I'm certainly not arg arguing, and I wouldn't argue against diversity per se. What I'm arguing for is that there are better alternatives, cheaper alternatives, safer alternatives in bringing that plant back online. And, and you mentioned cost. That's an important factor. So let me address that for a moment. We have heard for months that Helco and PGV have been negotiating the possibility of a lower price for the first 25 megawatts from that power plant, which since 1992-93, when that power plant first came online, the first 25 megawatts have been compensated at the so-called avoided cost rate, which tracks the price of petroleum. Okay, so as oil goes up, and it's been around 60 bucks a barrel for a number of months, as oil goes up, more likely than going down over time, essentially you've got power plant operators like PGV and ORMAT, which are making windfall profits because their expenses don't go up commensurately as, as they get rewarded more handsomely. Back in 2010 and 2011, as Helco and PGV were, were negotiating for an additional 13, 14 megawatts on top of those 25 megawatts, the 13 or so megawatts, the new megawatts, we'll call them, were at a fixed price, which was seen more advantageous and also mandated by law uh, by a legislative act signed by the governor, Lingle, back in 2006 that banned avoided cost contracts altogether across the state. Back in 2010 and 2011, ORMAT could have agreed to have the entire output of that power plant at a fixed lower cost. They chose not to. They chose to keep the first 25 megawatts at avoided cost. Why? Because it was more profitable for them to do so. so well, would now, you change your mind on this? Would it, would it soften your position if they came forward and said we, uh, that they would um, change it now? They would uh, reduce the price now? That's a great question, and my answer is not to the point of me saying, well, I guess it's okay because they're willing to sell it cheaper. I still fall back on we can do better, we must do better. This is inherently not a safe bet when there are better alternatives in that solar and storage is coming down, has come down significantly in the past several years alone. And yes, even though it is not considered 100% baseload firm power, we are getting there. We are getting there. And renewables that don't drill into the earth in a highly hot, active, seismic lava zone, we can do better mm -hmm. than Interesting. pursuing those types Years of Years ago, resources. everybody was so hot about geothermal. Now it's not, not really happening. So uh, what I get out of this is that uh, ORMAT has spent a lot of money trying to uh, rebuild its system, trying to get back online. Uh, I think they, they actually put in money for a roadway. Uh, they've been as, as, uh, as ardent as they could be, I think, aside from changing the price, uh, to get back online. But they're not back online. And now the government is going to be looking at them from multiple points of view um, and, and delaying, again, delaying uh, the possibility of them getting back online. So it could be just by, you know, de facto delay, it could be the end for ORMAT. If I were a, a, a New York bank, I'm not so sure I'd... I'd uh, invest a lot of money right now. They've already spent a lot of money getting to where they are, but they're going to have to spend a lot more money after that to uh, get back online. So there well, you have it. Say, Jay, 
Yeah. When when you say they, you know, I'm not privy to this this confidential information, but there's no doubt in my mind that their insurance company or companies have ponied up substantial amounts of money in the millions and millions range, most likely, for business interruption, uh, which obviously for the past year they haven't been able to sell any power, which my rough calculation is somewhere in the 2 to $3 million a month in terms of what they sell to Helco. So, you know, how much of it is coming out of Ormat's pocket versus the insurer's pocket. We don't know. That's, uh, you know, private information. But, you know, insurance companies typically don't like to keep on paying and paying and paying and paying with no one in sight. So, you know, the juicy question for me is how long is said insurance companies going to continue to pay these millions of dollars for bringing the trying to bring the plant oh, back online. I'm sure that's a matter and of contract. Matter. Yeah, whatever it is, yeah. that's going to be a matter of what's in the insurance policy, which, as you said, we don't know. Marco, it's time to say goodbye. I'd like to hand the honors to you. Would you say goodbye oh, to our viewers and listeners? I don't want to say goodbye, Jay. We, we, we <laughs> didn't get to public uh, benefits regulation, which is so hot and juicy, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get one of our uh, PUC friends on uh, next time or the time after that, and we can take a dive into PBR, which is, uh, which is lots of good stuff. So thanks so much for having me on. It's been great to be back with you. Yeah, next time, performance-based regulation. We'll go into that in detail. Marco Mangelsdorf, Energy 808, The Cutting Edge. Thank you so much, Marco. Talk soon. You rock, my friend. Thank you. Aloha.